will be about DIY NSA. The hashtag is on screen, hashtag DIY NSA. Um, uh, after the session, we have uh, presents for uh, some of you. They're over here. They're super cool caps. Make the NSA great again. They're not, they're not enough for everyone. So first come, first serve. Uh, but if you want one, make sure you'll get in line. The, the, the deal is that we then get to take a picture, a group picture with all of us with the hats. That'd be nice. <laughs> then we get like a nice souvenir. Cool. So I'm Adam Bijsbos, and this is my colleague Tim Schep. Um, we're going to talk about big data and profiling uh, this afternoon, um, and um, more um, uh, importantly the uh, uh, effects it has, namely uh, database in, uh, inequality. So we're from the Netherlands. You probably uh, had, have seen the cheese we brought. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Western Austin, Austin does not um, um, uh, allow us to uh, share the cheese with, uh, with you guys. So, um, yeah, looking at cheese is almost as good as eating cheese. <laughs> but um, this is the Netherlands. Um, uh, tulips, of course. Uh, tulips come from the Netherlands. Well, originally they come from uh, Turkey, but we're known for it. Uh, AKA Holland, AKA windmills, AKA the place where Dutch people live. And there's some cheese again. This is the way we would, would have liked uh, to serve the cheese to you guys. It's typical uh, for Dutch birthdays. This is the way you serve che cheese. This is the way you celebrate. Um, the lowest point in the Netherlands is 6.7 meters. For those of you who don't um, measure in meters, it's 22 feet below sea level. We're the tallest people in the world. Um, our average length for women is 5.6 feet and for men 6 feet. Nice. And we also like to party. And Dutch parties are mostly about sharing good food with friends, um, trying out high fashion outfits to impress your friends, really, really about celebrating and joy. And we also like biking, of course. So, uh, the Netherlands is a country, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's full of 16.7 unique individuals. And can we get to know them better? So, um, later in this presentation, we're going to call a random one. Um, uh, but more on that later. Um, over to you, Tim. Thanks. All right. Before we start, before we continue on, on big data, I'll talk a little bit about setup, which is a we are. We are a media lab in Utrecht, the Netherlands, um, and we do all kinds of, uh, we used to say strange things with computers, but now we say fun things with computers. Um, <coughs> we are a, a non-profit, uh, and what we try to do is, uh, well, we are in the field of culture, so we try to explore technology from a cultural standpoint, from a critical test standpoint, often from a humanity standpoint, try to understand what the hell is going on with all the technology, right? Because it's happening so fast and we need time to reflect on that. And I think as a society it's very difficult for us to critically reflect on that. So what we try to do is we help try to help understand the Dutch society to help them understand technology better, get a more nuanced perspective. And that's very difficult. So oftentimes with technology we think it's either going to be awesome and great, and, you know, or we think, oh, it's going to be horrible and think of the children. But it's very rare that we find a good middle ground. So we try to help a wider audience get better understanding of what's going on. And the best way to explain that to you is, I think, if I show you some <laughs> examples of the work that we do. So I'm going to show you two examples before we continue. The first one was a project we, we presented last year here at Spear South by called Cuddly Drones. And Cuddly Drones was an educational program uh, that we did for, uh, for children. We asked children to design drones, drones that actually flew. Um, by making little shells that we, we, we you know, put onto drones. And they made all kinds of new and innovative uh, solutions, like this is a trash drone um, that picks up trash, but we've got, uh, what's, I don't remember what the hell this one is, but we have a tennis drone, and we had, we had a, a cocktail drone, we had a, this is a karaoke drone, by the way, it, it flies the microphone into the audience, so if you have stage fright, then you don't have to worry, because it, it brings it to you. Isn't that great? 
This is a candy teddy is really okay. Anyway, all kinds of funny drones, and we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, and it was for us a way to talk about surveillance issues with these children, because they understand then what a drone is, and then we can finally uh, better talk about uh, then what the issues are. Like, you know, does is a drone smarter than a guinea pig? Uh, do you like to have a drone that follows you around? If your parents don't follow you then, but a drone does, is that better or not? All kinds of difficult questions about surveillance. Another project that we did uh, last year uh, as well was uh, the Everyone's a Spy campaign. And in it we tried to, again, get people to understand something very important, which is that more and more we are living in a surveillance culture, which we all ourselves are, are part of that. And, I think it's an important craft to, like, it's a basic thing to understand, but I think it's an important thing to understand. Uh, you've got top-down surveillance, which is the classic Big Brother idea, but you also have surveillance, which is like when you film a cop, for example, you're watching a watcher, like you're, you're controlling the controllers, you're making some kind of counter power. But what we're, we're really interested in is covalence, which is this idea that people themselves are increasingly starting to watch each other. We are all becoming spies of each other, right? We're making the job of the NSA really easy because we are sharing updates on Facebook about each other, etc. So this, and of course, Google Glass is the ultimate covalence device. So we see this happening and we want people to understand this, that it's no longer the, the, the classic surveillance camera that's the issue, but we have to, have to rethink it. So we, we work with artists and, and thinkers to get better images. So this is a, an image that represents, uh, the, you know, it still has the movement of the security camera, but it's faces of people of nowadays. So this is artist Jeffrey Liedemann, together with Thomas Hoogeling, a journalist, and they made this campaign. And this was in, on screens all over the Netherlands, urban screens, we, we had a big campaign on that. Another example was uh, these posters by uh, um, Ruben Pater and Hans de Zwart. Ruben is designer and Hans is the director of Bits of Freedom, a uh, nonprofit that also looks at these kind of issues. So we put these all over the Netherlands to really get people to understand the message that, that more and more these social media are also a form of, of unwanted surveillance. Um, but the thing that got the most attention in the campaign was a web shop that uh, Yuri Veerman and Dimitri Dogmetz has built. Uh, it's a web shop that sells mugs with children's pictures on them. I've got one right here. And the fun thing is that these pictures come from Flickr. And they were uploaded by parents who, without really realizing it, gave it a license that allowed commercial reuse. <laughs> So they made a web shop with 100 mugs of 100 different kids, and of course that thing went viral like crazy because all the parents wanted to know, is my kid on there? Is my kid being sold? The tagline was something like, someone, you know, someone's favorite child on your favorite mug. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we really liked that. And, and, and that even reached CNN, you know, that thing went really viral and then reached news all over the world. So it was a really great uh, yeah, uh, situation for us where we really got to you know, spread the message. Um, and of course, we're really happy with this guy. This guy also really helped us spread this message, spread the understanding that technology is not just some kind of <coughs> gift and that it's all great, but there are also downsides that we have to understand better. Um, what we really, what really noticed with Edward Snowden's release, and I think uh, some other journalists as well, too few people got angry. Right? It, it was like we accepted it in a way. And I think that's because a lot of people don't really understand the consequences or that they don't really feel the consequences. So what we try to do is we try to make it fun to help them understand the issues in a fun and attractive way. And that's a big thing for us at Setup. We always try to make our things hilarious in some way. And make it emotional, right? We can have a very cerebral talk about all this, about surveillance, why privacy is important. <coughs> but if you can make them feel it and understand it in, a, in their gut, that has more impact. So we really like, for instance, what, what uh, uh, John Orford does when he tries to tell people, you know, the NSA has your dick pics, right? To make it more visceral and more understandable. So yeah, so what we really noticed in the past couple of years is that we really need to talk as a society about big data issues. Like right now, the dominant narrative is that big data is just gold and fantastic, and we really want to explain that it you know, has some downsides. And I think every time you click one of these buttons, you know, we're all sharing more and more of us, and we don't really understand the consequences. But literally, we don't read these licenses, so we don't know. Um, and we see the rise of this, this group of data brokers and all these businesses and companies that are combining this data, sharing it, and reselling it. And it's, it's becoming a huge market, right? This is really a growth market. So what we realize that setup is that if we really want to adequately discuss these situations, this problem, then it might be a good idea if we started building a big database of ourselves, of our own, that we really you know, talk with about these issues in the coming years. And that's where I give the word back to my colleague, Ellen.
Yeah, because uh, we thought um, to uh, grapple a bit with um, uh, when things get scary, uh, maybe you should do an experiment. So um, we wanted to create a database of all Dutch people, um, and we uh, named it the National Birthday Calendar. So we set ourselves the goal to um, uh, create a national birthday calendar, including um, uh, names of all Dutch people, uh, but also uh, uh, dates of birth. Uh, but of course, a little bit of a little a little bit extra. Uh, we wanted to see if we could also um, um, uh, do uh, gift suggestions based on profiling. So. Um, um, we uh, started off, um, and um, <laughs> yeah, uh, with uh, with a hackathon, um, and it became a series of hackathons. But before we really got started, um, we had to take some <laughs> um, 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 yeah precautions uh, because. Um, um, we're an art. We, we're doing an, an art project, but it does not mean um, uh, we could do everything. So uh, um, it all started with writing a letter to the Dutch Privacy Authority, uh, explaining what we were gonna do, um, uh, and then um, we got in touch with people from the privacy company. It's a company uh, with a privacy law lawyer um, and data protection officers. So they, they helped us out um, in, in, in advising how we should uh, um, uh, really organize this, this <coughs> humongously uh, weird and a bit scary project. So um, um, the first thing we decided, well, it's not going to be online. So uh, yeah, um, and, and it's going to be on an encrypted server. So we really, what we gather is going to stay with us and we're not sharing it, because we're not here to help the NSA out. Uh, we're here to make our own, create our own NSA. Um, so, and we um, uh, did not use, uh, we did not hack. We only used uh, public sources, um, uh, and we really scraped the web. Um, and our data protection officers, they told us, well, you should stay away from sensitive data. What does that mean? It means data um, about, uh, for example, your sexual preference, uh, your race, um, um, uh, medical uh, uh, medical stuff, stuff like that. Right. Stuff that, that you, you'd say, well, in another context, um, uh, that kind of information could be um, harmful. So we stayed away from that, um, and that um, um, seems easy, but I'll tell you a little bit more later about how we accidentally uh, got sensitive data too. Um, and we needed to, to keep track of the sources, and every um, uh, volunteer uh, at our hackathon needed to um, um, sign uh, a lease, uh, uh, sign um, uh, a contract with uh, well, a non-disclosure stuff, um, etc. So it, uh, before we even got started, there was uh, this whole legal stuff we had to deal with. Um, so we spent six, six Saturdays, which is, um, well, um, in, in comparison with the NSA, it's like nothing. Um, and um, there were 35 hackers involved, um, and they were all volunteers. And um, uh, people of all uh, levels of skills, they joined in. There was this one guy who didn't know how to build scrapers or even code, but he was really, really good at Googling stuff. <laughs> um, so he, 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 he found the, the, the weirdest data sets um, we could even <coughs> imagine. Uh, but on, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, there was this guy who helped us unlock WARC files, and uh, none of the other people at the hackathons had, had even heard of what a WARC file even was. But he said, oh yeah, I, I make WARC files all the time. Here, I'm going to unlock the WARC file. So um, um, everybody uh, was just welcome to join in. 
um, no matter what their uh, level of skill was, and it was great fun. Um, so then, scraping the web. What did we find? Uh, well, uh, a lot. Um, what, what is WARC files? A oh, WARC files is a, an archive file that uh, used by uh, archive.org. And they save websites, you know, they scrape websites that are about to die and then they go in with a team and save all of it. Yeah. So they save, for example, uh, Hives, which is a yeah. social media website from the Netherlands that's no longer active, it doesn't exist anymore, but before it went dark, they copied the whole thing and made one huge work file that is, yeah. you know, gigabytes large and has all kinds of, you know, basically saved all the data. I see a couple of Dutch people, um, <laughs> uh, okay, it's scared right now, <laughs> because, um, uh, Heis was this uh, uh, super neat pre-Facebook uh, social media website and um, you guys thought it was all gone, but it's not. <laughs> it's still there. Um, um, so is schoolbank.nl, uh, which is uh, in schoolbank.nl. Classmates.com. Um, Classmates.com, Classmates yeah. It was a website where you could uh, uh, well, sign up and then you could find your uh, former classmates. Well, uh, we all have Facebook for that right now. We don't need a separate website for that. So, um, uh, School Bank, um, nobody uses it anymore, but a lot of people in the Netherlands still have an account there. And uh, they made that account like 15 email addresses ago, so they don't, they, they probably forgot about uh, their account there. And if they do remember, there's no way for them to delete it because they don't use that email address anymore. Um, so yeah, we got two million school bank accounts, um, which is uh, quite a lot uh, compared to uh, the 16.7 million unique individuals that we have in the Netherlands. Um, so yeah, and, and um, uh, 77,000 uh, Amateur soccer players, for example, 26,000 uh, accountants. Um, um, we got five million phone book records, but we also got cute little quaint stuff like clarinet players from Morgestel. So there's there was a lot in there, a lot of <laughs> weird wacky stuff. Um, but the, um, um, yeah, the, the the thing that the the most useful stuff to us was the well, the, the faded internet glory, like uh, uh, um, school bank, classmates.com. Um, uh, that was very useful to us because uh, it was it's, it's a dilapidated website. The security is crap. There's no frequency cap on it. If you want to <laughs> scrape it, it's well, it's just an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, and the same goes for another obscure social media website called um, uh, It's a social media website for uh, people of 50 years and older, and they, well, it, uh, yeah, they hang out there, and uh, some 17,000 people still have an account there, and it was just bingo, and, it, and it, on 50plusser.nl there was a lot of stuff, like really a lot. We were just amazed at how much we could get. We could get uh, hobbies, interests, favorite books, um, uh, movies, um, but also really sad stories about their hernia. Um, but um, so there was very uh, uh, much there, and um, yeah. But also the the, the 50 pluser uh, .nl, um, website uh, also uh, put us to a couple of problems because we thought, yay, there's so much in there. Uh, but then um, in their uh, the, the the bios they wrote about themselves, there was a lot of stuff about diseases and medical conditions. Like, oh yeah. Um, but even in the the field. Uh, work. Um, they said, yeah, um, I used to work, but since my uh, pancreas cancer, um, um, it, it's, it's all bad now and I've lost my job. So we could use that stuff, right? Because we promised to not use sensitive data. Um, so that was a puzzle, because how to filter out those kind of 
uh, information to not to not to not put it in our uh, uh, database. Uh, there was even a woman. We thought, okay, well the books are harmless, like the books field. If people say what their favorite book is, that can be sensitive information, right? But there was this one one woman who said she liked lesbian books. And um, yeah, so we couldn't use that because our data protection officer said, yeah, probably if you're reading lesbian books, that means you're lesbian. So uh, we couldn't use that. Um, uh, but there were, were all kinds of, uh, uh, um, well, challenges we, we met. Like for example, yeah, if, when, when merging, we're merging all the different data sets together, there's this, yeah, how to know if John Doe from dataset A <coughs> is the same person as the John Doe from dataset B. Um, um, also, in, uh, at the um, uh, Schoolbank, the, the classmates website, um, the first name and the last name, they were in separate fields, um, but there were just full names, which made the, the, the matching to other datasets really difficult. Um, well, my name is Adam Bicebos. That's pretty straightforward because, well, you can see, well, Ellen, that's the first name, then Bicebos, that's the last name. But in the Netherlands, there are also people that are called Martin Young, Fennefor, Hesseling, and then it's all mishmash, and you don't know which one is the first name, which one is the last name, is the guy married, does he have two <coughs> names? Um, so it's really difficult. So we. We needed to write pieces of code to uh, uh, clean up the, the, the messy stuff and really uh, uh, detect the first names and the last names. Um, and then there was there were also the, the silly mistakes. Like um, we had the five million uh, phone book records, um, uh, and, and and we were trying to merge it with the other data. Uh, but then we find that we 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 well. Why isn't it working? We were struggling with it, and we were like, damn, what, why, it's five million records. How, how come there are so little matches uh, with other uh, data? And then we found out we accidentally used the yellow pages instead of the white pages. So yeah, um, those aren't people's comments. So um, uh, uh, there, were, there was um, a lot of stuff that was uh, challenging while uh, creating the birthday calendar. Um, but then after all the struggles we uh, um, went on with, uh, with the profiling stuff and then it got really fun. Because uh, when the, after we uh, over, overcame the, the, the whole phone book problem, we got a lot of addresses of Dutch people. So, and when you have addresses, um, there's so much you can do, like the average income in your neighborhood, the size of your house. Um, so there was, um, but also um, uh, the uh, match with the uh, classmates dot and now uh, uh, stuff. Uh, we could say something about your um, well, your level of education, which gives uh, an idea on well. Um, should we give a uh, Nietzsche book, um, or uh, should we maybe give a selfie stick? Well, it's a, it's <laughs> we're talking education. Well, yeah, it's a it's a scale. It's it's the selfie stick on one side. It's a book by Nietzsche on the other side, and then there's a lot of presents in between. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not taking a piss at people who, have a, who own a selfie stick, but come on, you guys. Um, but yeah, and if you know um, uh, data on addresses, there's uh, a lot, and, and also uh, this website, um, funda.nl, uh, it's a site uh, um, uh, where you can uh, look at houses. Uh, that are for sale, um, and um, uh, when using Funda, you can you you know if people have a garden, so then you know if you can if the the birthday present can be a goat or not. <laughs> um, but then we 
we really went out of our way and we also matched uh, our data to the, um, um, the music charts uh, because there's historical data on that. And then we said, oh, well, we, we know what the, the, um, the, 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 the well, the number, no, numbers one in the charts were historically, and we know how through the time, uh, through time, um, the average age um, in which, on which people have sex for the first time changes through time. So we, um, we know the soundtrack to when you lost your, your virginity. And maybe it was Barbara. Who knows? Of, we know of some people in our birthday calendar that indeed Barbie Girl was the song they lost their virginity to. So yeah, um, the results so far, um, because it's it's an ongoing process and we still uh, are still working on uh, our calendar. Um, of the 16.7 million Dutch people, we have uh, 700, uh, 793,251 uh, unique persons, but there's still a lot to be done, because we know those are unique, uh, they're real persons, and, but there, then there's uh, like 8 million data points left that we, we haven't figured out yet. It's a work in progress. Yeah, it's, we don't know if, well, they're probably real, but we don't know if those 8 million are unique. Like, it could be, uh, they're not matched yet. So, uh, second thing is um, the wins we made for privacy. Because, um, for example, the uh, accountants registry in the Netherlands they um, uh, noticed that we uh, got uh, 26,000 accountants, registered accountants, um, and they thought, well, hey, 26,000 registered accountants were the guys who, who are running the, the register. Um, so um, they uh, uh, gave us a phone call. Um, and uh, they said, well, uh, could you please remove our accountants uh, from your birthday calendar? And we said, oh, of course, we're not here to, um, well, bully accountants. That's not what we started, started the project for. Um, but we did make a deal. Uh, and now, because we got the, uh, well, first names, last names, addresses, and uh, dates of birth of all the 26,000 accountants, but they changed um, um, the way uh, uh, their website. So now people only can see um, um, the, the initials, the la and the last name, and uh, they well they, they uh, deleted the first names and um, uh, birthdays. So um, um, we made the world a bit more privacy friendly for accountants. So yeah, you're welcome accountants. <laughs> so this is why they did, oh yeah, uh, of course, uh, Martin Kasman is, is, it's not a real name, um, because not only because Kasman means cheese man, which would be a ridiculous name, but also because of the, um, yeah, our very, very strict data protection officers. Uh, but the third thing, the third thing, um, yeah, I'm really happy with is that we got to know Luke. Uh, for privacy reasons, we won't say his last name, but we know a lot about Luke. He's this 46-year-old year accountant, and he's awesome. And um, um, this is um, this is uh, um, his primary school. Uh, um, it's called the Agnes uh, school. school. Um, uh, but you can see that uh, because we found his, uh, uh, his primary school on, uh, uh, on Google, but you can see that um, it's probably, you no, know, the, the school moved probably because you see signs that the, the building's for sale. 
Um, so that's too bad because I know a couple of years my primary school it burnt down. It's always so hard that that, that there you, you can't go back to your youth. So I really feel for you. Um, but luckily he's still very active in soccer. Um, he plays for the for OVCS in Tilburg. Um, so that's good for him because he's got a lot of soccer friends. Um, this is uh, a photo we uh, we found. Um, um, curiously, yeah, we don't know uh, which one of them is Luke. Um, and curiously, there were uh, um, uh, under the photo at the attack at the, in the photo were more. Um, people then are actually in the photo, so we're not even sure he's in there. Um, but yeah, these are the guys he hangs, uh, he hangs out with on Saturdays. Um, so that's great for him. And um, um, there's a reason, by the way, that we took we, we sh were showing this picture um, because our data protection officer said that. Um, if it's about 10 or 15 um, people, then it's not personal data. I really think that's, that's um, weird. Like, oh, sh should we? Because I, I like to, 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 um, uh, to have an exact num number, but she says, yeah, well, just 10 or, 10 or 15, you'll be fine. So, so you can narrow it down further than that. If you can, then it's called personal data. But if, yeah. if you can't, it's like always like one of these 15 people, then you're fine. Yeah. But 10 or 15, 10 to 15. So that, that really... Uh, Give a piece of guessing. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, should we go for oh, uh, 10 to 15? <coughs> you'll be fine. Um, so yeah, uh, good for you, Luke. Um, yeah. Time to keep our promise. Um, we uh, promised that we would call uh, someone for, from the database. Um, so we're going to do that right now. We talked to our privacy officers about this. We wanted to think of something fun that we could do. And uh, they actually said this was OK, <laughs> to our surprise. Um, so we had to do some, some, uh, some things beforehand. We had to make sure they were not in the sensitive part of the database, which you know, of course they're not. <laughs> Um, and we did, we're not going to show you the last names and all that kind of thing, but we are allowed to call them because, according to our privacy officer, they did put the information online, so there is a certain yeah. level of uh, privacy there. Uh, yeah. We can we can bring our our server uh, due to privacy legislations. We can take it to the U.S. So um, <coughs> we picked five, um, but you guys can pick which one we should call. I have five phone numbers in my phone, in my cell. So which one? Uh, Tell us. Should, which should one? we call Eric? <laughs> so it's, what time is it now? It's, it's it could be sleeping. It's, it's, it's about yeah. maybe, uh, yeah. it's six hours later in the Netherlands. It's six hours later, it's in, later in the Netherlands. So it's, it's his birthday right now. <laughs> and it's about uh, <laughs> 10 in the evening. Oh, 10 in the evening. Their so so birthdays are all today? Yeah, yeah. Their birthdays are all today. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. all today. Yeah. Okay. So, we're gonna, so uh, it's, it's 10 in the evening right now, so we're we're just in time. And we would like, of course, we're not calling them for nothing. We, our question to you is, will you help us sing happy birthday to you? Yeah. 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 Right. right on. <laughs> so number three, Frank, yeah. Do we have to sing in Dutch? Oh. No, we don't. Just happy birthday. All right. We thought about this. We're gonna like try to get them to speak English. Dutch people generally speak English quite well, so. Can I ask you something? Yeah. How did you get the cell? Sorry. How did you get the cell numbers? From the phone book. I'm going. Shh. Hello. 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 Speak with Frank Jan. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Van Gogh. Happy birthday to you. Hey. Hartelijk gefeliciteerd, Van Gogh. Ik, ik, ik bel je straks, ik, 
bel je straks anders even terug, dan leg ik het allemaal uit. Uh, ik, ik, ja. Oké. Okay. Joe. You guys are awesome, thank you. I said um, I'm gonna, uh, I'll come after the presentation to explain a bit what we did, but I don't think he, uh, <laughs> he had any idea. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, <laughs> you might think that this sounds all a bit, little bit crazy, and, and, uh, and, and it is to a degree, that's the whole point. Um, like I said, profiling is a huge market, and, and we really want to talk about this. And I was wondering, who of you have heard, heard of the company Palantir? Oh, yeah, you're a knowledgeable crowd, but not everyone. Uh, usually when, when, beforehand when we talked about this project, no one really knew about it. Uh, Palantir, as you the people know, it's, it's, we don't know, it's, it's, it's uh, worth $20 billion right now. In the last couple of years, it's skyrocketed. It's, it's a unicorn now. Uh, it's at the moment, I think, bigger than Twitter in current stock valuation. So it's a huge company, but no, hardly anyone in, in the you know, normal people have heard of it. Uh, and they're, of course, part of this big market of data brokers and data enrichment. But what Palantir does is they take data for governments and companies and make it understandable and, and mesh it together to do basically what we did in a way. But like I said, they're part of a big, uh, a big series of organizations that do this. A number of companies who offer data enrichment services to help as many organizations as wanted, if they pay for it, to get this data. So this is a serious thing, and, and of course our, our, our funny project is trying to point that out. What these companies will tell you, like I said before, is they'll tell you data is a new gold. I think, I think that's something that we have to talk about. I think that's one of the things that our project really tries to hit home, that data it might, not, it might be gold for them, right? but it might not be gold for the average citizen. Um, so we wanted to make this understandable to people with this project, like what can you do with the data? Right? People are, are, are getting your data, now, so what? But they don't know what, what can happen, so I think we, we want to talk about that more. And I think what you see in, in, in the field, in, in the market, is that there are a lot of uh, uh, insurance companies, for example, who offer a discount if you give them your data. You might have heard that here in the United States as well. Companies that, if you put a tracking device in your car, then they know how much you drive, and you only pay as much as you drive for your insurance. But in return, it does mean that you tell them pretty much all the time where you go. Um, so we, it's an interesting situation um, that might have some downsides that we need to talk about. I think what for us, the, the big word is that we have to talk about this is, is behavior. Like the stuff that all this data does with us, it, it influences our behavior. It influences how we act. Like if you have a car tracker in your, in your car that tracks where you go, you might start to change your behavior and drive a bit more safely. I mean, that's the whole point for the insurance company, isn't it? So, so this stuff does that. And that's something that we really uh, have, to have to question. To give another example, this is Magister is a Dutch uh, company that um, registers all the grades for all children <coughs> in primary school. But not only that, it doesn't just take the grades, uh, it doesn't offer that just as a cloud service, but it also takes notes on these children to find out you know, what kind of child they are. So if you go to a year higher, then your new teacher will know, well, this is a bit of a troublemaker, you know, like, that, that kind of information is, is stored in there. And what you see happening there is that a teacher who, who gets his new child might not give that child a clean slate. You know, they, they don't have a clean slate anymore. They are all, you know, obviously, there's so much data about you now, it's difficult to escape that. There's always this, this, this influence, this, this preconceived notion that's hidden in the data, that's stuck in the data. And another example that's interesting is, is uh, Crystal Nose. Has anyone used this? Right, two people. Uh, I thought it might also be fun to try this live. Um, so uh, let's try that. But I thought I would try something for someone from the audience that we can look you up. So I can show you that, that this stuff is actually reaching consumers now. Like, this is something we can all do. So I'd like to have someone's name from the audience who probably has an online, but you already use the service. How about you? It's you, sir. Never use it. What's your name? Saker. S A K E R. That's your last name, right? Yeah, that's my first name. <laughs> Saker is your first name, oh, sir. What happened there? Clipston, like that? K L I P P S T E N. K L I P P S T E N. Right, that? S S T E N. All right, that's the final. But you can find it. Here we go. So this, this might be a bit. Wrong um, one. Is that you? There was two of them. I sometimes use the wrong picture, so it might still be you. 
That's from our website, then. Hmm. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll take this clip for now because then I can get on with it. But this is like a website that uh, looks at everything you've pretty much posted online that's available as well, mostly using LinkedIn data and, and, uh, and Twitter and stuff like that. It looks at that and tries to offer an emotional analysis, like an analysis of your character based on the words that you use, for example. So, Sager is diplomatic listener and careful planner, patient, people-oriented, logical, and instinctively seeks predictability. And then it offers all kinds of advice, mostly uh, the, 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 what it tries to offer you is that you can write the best email to someone you don't know yet, but in a way that will convince them to you know, help you out. So when emailing Sager, you use a form of greeting, so apparently he's a bit of a formalist. Well, you know, for me, of course, yeah, you wouldn't need to do that. Um, point out personal connections, like common friends. Anyway, so it offers this kind of vague-ish, but still interesting, like oftentimes when we use this, it, it is kind of correct, oddly enough. So, you know, it's not very far off the mark. So these kind of things are now available in the market, and, and they're kind of, well, I would say, creepy. Um, Why? Um, Oh, that's an interesting question. I think it offers an unfair advantage that we're not really used to yet. And that, that uh, I don't really like the idea that someone is, is finding out my personality and I'm not in control of that. But that's another story. Where do uh, you draw the information from? How do you know it's accurate? Well, I've, I've talked to a lot of people like just um, when, for instance, we've been on television to talk about this a while ago and you dragged where we're from. And then we tried it with some people live on television and then it was, you know, uh, we tried with some other people. We've tried a lot of people doing this and oftentimes it's correct. Sometimes it's completely wrong, but oftentimes it's correct. And the point is it doesn't even matter if it's correct. The fun thing is that some people will assume it's correct about you. Right? It doesn't even matter that data is not correct about you. It's assumed to be correct. Um, so what you see is that this, this stuff is pretty powerful. It's getting more powerful and it's not very transparent. I mean, you don't really know how Crystal Nose does its thing, where it gets it from exactly or, or how it decides all this. So it's pretty powerful, not very transparent, and of course that means that China got interested in this. Um, so what you see in China is they're building a social credit system. Mm -hmm. It's a score for every Chinese person that kind of means how good of a citizen they are, how well behaved, basically. Um, and this is what they say about it. They say, when people's behavior isn't bound by their morality, a system must be used to restrict their actions. So it's, it's, they have a lot of faith in their citizens, obviously. Um, the system will be based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. And from 2020 onwards, each adult citizen should, besides his own identity card, have such a credit code. So they're making this mandatory. So that, I hope you understand that, what that means. Uh, so everyone's going, and they're, but they're not wasting any time. This is the first version already. They're working together with Alibaba, one of the largest Chinese uh, uh, companies. This is the Sesame Credit Score app, and it already gives you a score based on what you buy and, and uh, your credit worthiness and if you pay your bills on time. And it's already hooked up to the largest dating website in China. And uh, so it allows you to kind of see if your potential date is trustworthy or not. So, yeah, that's interesting to us. So things like are you buying the right things become kind of important. Uh, and also, you know, it might influence getting a loan or a visa, so if you're not a good citizen, you might not be able to leave China as easily uh, as other people. What, what scares us the most, or scares me the most, is that your friend score, your, your score influences your friend score. So if you have a low score in the system, then you might drag down your friends. And I start to wonder, like, what will that do to the social fabric of such a country? What, will you get a new kind of stratification, a new type of data discrimination, where it's not about, um, you know, your gender or all that stuff, but it's about what you do, your behavior, your data. And I think we're less primed to understand this. This is a lot more invisible. And of course, Sesame Credit will not divulge exactly how it calculates its credit scores, explaining that it's a sort of complex algorithm. So again, you see this, this untransparency of the whole system. You, you don't really know. Um, so that's where we are now. This is, this is something that worries us. So what we really want to do now is, is have poke more fun at this behavior design aspect of big data. That's a bit of a next step. What we're going to do in the next year, in this 2016, is we're going to um, ask artists to work with our database, basically. Um, and we want to uh, yeah, get them to, to make these, these visceral insights into what privacy really is about. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a traveling experience based on our database. Because we're, we don't want to put it online, like we said. It's, it's too private for that, too personal. Uh, and, but we will travel it to festivals and library so people who can show us their identification can look it up, look at it, and find their own data. But of course we'll use that moment to get even more data about them <laughs> possible. 
Yeah. Anyway, our, we were working with uh, um, theater makers who are, are working on this, making this an interesting experience. Another thing we're going to make uh, this year is, is more towards the Internet of thing, Things. We're going to make devices that will discriminate depending on your profile and the information that we have on you. So, for example, you might have a toaster that will uh, burn your toast just a little bit if you have a bad profile. <laughs> to give an example, but we're asking artists and creatives and makers to make all kinds of devices like this, and we're hoping to sell that in a fake shop in the shopping mall in the center of the future. And, uh, and yeah, again, that's a way for us to reach the wider audience about these issues and understanding that these devices are not, uh, that, you know, could do this. So the whole point that we're trying to make is that big data does have a downside. I think we don't talk about that as often. Yet. We'd like to give them a sense of data is not neutral, because the algorithms that handle them are not neutral. You know, like the Chinese government decides what is you know, good and what is bad, and they, they put it inside of their algorithms, so these algorithms are not neutral, and the data is not either. And we often hear that data is new gold, but we don't think it is. We don't think it's new gold for people at all. We think a better metaphor for data would be to call it the new oil. Because with oil, we understand a lot better than with gold that there are downsides to it. Like gold is just great, but oil, you know, it's great for some stuff, you know, all kinds of stuff are driving around, but it also has, has you know, done this kind of thing. And we've, after 50 years of working with oil, even longer, we've, we've really have finally understood this better. And I think with big data, we have to have this kind of attitude to, towards it. Yes, it can be great, but it also can pollute our social environment. So what we've learned in all this is in the past two, three years, working with these, these revelations of Edward Snowden and working on these projects that explain privacy in a, in a fun way, is that you do have something to hide. But it's not about being a terrorist, it's, it's about your everyday life, right? about the chance that you get to, to find a job or, or find a date uh, in all these, these brave new worlds. So um, it's way more day to day, way more normal. I think this is what people don't see yet. They're like, oh yeah, I don't have enough to hide. You know everything, no. <laughs> it's about this kind of stuff. Anyway, what also is a, maybe a nice thing is that I've finally been able to define privacy. For me, privacy is the right to be imperfect the right to not be the perfect consumer or the perfect citizen. Like, like as we're here in Austin, it's, it's the right to be weird, right? Keep Austin weird, keep people weird. And, and that's only possible if we have some free space and, and are not controlled or not nudged in certain directions all the bloody time. So I think this is something that we don't really, uh, as a society, understand this well yet. I, and I think we should. Um, so yeah, because price is the right to make mistakes, and I think even in an entrepreneurial setting that I think the South by is, is mostly, um, when you have privacy, you are more able to, to create and to be crazy and to come up with new ideas and think out of the box, right? And to feel less pressure to conform. And that might be good for innovation, right? So privacy might help innovation. It's an argument I'm not, you know, I think we have to make better, or that, but I think it's an interesting angle. <coughs> uh, so I'm very happy that Apple, Apple is fine for this one. So I think as a society, we need to be able to keep breaking the rules. I think that's very important. And I worry that if we don't come together on this and understand this better, and we might, uh, might end up with a society that's much more well-behaved, sure, but also maybe less human. And I want to end with that. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's a microphone over there, so feel free to uh, jump in. <laughs> now I'm being recorded. Uh, fantastic talk. So uh, you touched briefly on credit card scores, which are also, to my knowledge, a privately calculated algorithm uh, that tracks all of our purchasing behavior. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm young, so I don't know any historical. Um, pushback on that, but I'm curious now why uh, private information is getting a pushback uh, where those types of scores haven't. Uh, and if, if there's, like, I, I guess, merit in what I'm saying. Uh, well, the pushback, you mean that, like, the people don't like it, or? Yeah. That's a good question, I don't know. Um, in Holland, the price of uh, credit scores are less of a thing, I think, less visible than they are in the United States, so uh, I'd have to bounce that question back. Um, you know, I, th I think we should. I think we should care about all this stuff. Right? It's, it's, I don't discriminate between these types of scoring systems. 
to answer the question anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm wondering, one of the uh, slides you said, will people behave better, it makes people behave better. But what about the aspect that it makes people be able to be in control of people and their behavior might not be better? Yeah, that, that's, um, of course, what is defined as good behavior? That's the <laughs> big question in this. What the Chinese government defines as good behavior. Who decides what good behavior is? Yeah. It's cultural. So, uh, yeah, because it doesn't good behavior really come out of other people being accountable to other people? Being, sorry? Doesn't good behavior come from being accountable to other people and not restricting who the other people are? Well, the, the Chinese government would disagree, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, that's again, it's a cultural value that we have, I think, and, and it's a, if we care about this, it is, then we have to put this into our systems, into our technology, and that might also mean that we don't build algorithms that imply that you are not able to decide this stuff for yourself, that, that force you to become a better human, but that we offer some space to people to develop themselves freely. But, yeah. I, I, I saw people. an artist sign and he said, when did it stop being about who is basically lying, cheating, and stealing, and it become about who gets to decide who is lying, cheating, and stealing? That was an interesting... I agree, that, that, that's the thing, who makes the algorithms, that person is getting a lot of power. And, uh, <coughs> And it's also very untransparent. And, and also, um, uh, when when profiling is used, it doesn't even matter who is really stealing or lying or cheating. Um, it's about you. You can even get a, a profile saying, "Oh, she's um, uh, she has a high risk for uh, <coughs> uh, cheating and lying." Uh, because your friends are cheating in line. It doesn't even mean uh, you have, you are uh, that kind of person. So there, it's it's also about all the, um, the assumptions that are be being made uh, because you are part of uh, a group profile and you're not seen as an individual. Yeah, it's, you become a statistic and a statistic starts to influence you in certain ways. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with one more saying that someone said, um, someone who has worked on Wall Street, his mentor, his mentor said to him, it doesn't matter whether the information is true, it, it matters whether the other person believes the exactly. information is true. Exactly. Yeah. So when I was younger, I used to put in a lot of, a lot of fake information, and then now that's coming to haunt me in a way, because now people think that I'm a, 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 some kind of weirdo, you know, so it's, it's a, of course I'm not a weirdo. <laughs> so yeah, so this is this yeah, it's become more difficult to uh, to play with that, I think as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting situation. So I wanted to you know like the insurance and the car insurance thing, like that that accepting that data and you know, lowering your rates and that kind of thing. As a, someone who does innovate and does make things, sometimes people like we don't make those kinds of things maliciously, right? We don't really intend like, like I made something for a building that when you walked in, it tracked all the people that walked in the building. And I had it, I did some smart stuff to make it look up, just to kind of, I wanted to pull these, the staff out of the building to see how, who comes in and that kind of thing. And I inadvertently made a thing that could track who came in, when, where, all this stuff, and it freaked me out. And so like, how do we, how do you balance that? Like be innovative and create good or useful tools and, and then, but also kind of protect. Well, what I think is, is happening is that, um, Technology is lowering the barrier to certain things that used to be a barrier to malicious use, but it no longer is. So, um, so now we have to put up artificial barriers, which means that we have to become more ethical about this thing, right? Like when it becomes so cheap to surveil everybody, then then that's no longer a barrier. So we have to start deciding. Well, maybe we shouldn't, even though we could, right? But that's a hard decision for society to make, especially when it's so cheap, guys. Come on, it's so cheap. Um, and we'll finally get all the terrorists and all that. So it's it's, it's uh, something that I think with all this advent of technology and advent of big data, we have to become more ethically aware and more uh, ethically backboned to, to stop these things. Do you think that will make people too, like with the insurance, you know, there's a lot of stuff about data breaches, right? Like they, they assume privacy of all of your driving data or like your iPhone about, you know, attract all your stuff. Well, then now they have a database that says this exact person drives here all the time and that got breached. I mean. Is that, do you see that becoming a trend more, like randomized, all that stuff, so it's actually protecting people? Or, you, I mean, because what happens is you have like a credit card breach.
here and now all of your every tour sheet you have or what was that, uh, like Ashley Madison, like that breaking out everyone's stuff's out there. You know that's gonna become more yeah, it, it's too bad that we didn't do our project in uh, uh, the U.S. because um, we uh, could have done a lot more stuff legally and, oh gosh, you guys have the best leaks. It's crazy. Right? It's crazy. Like, like, that's how it is. Like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would have loved to get my hands on Ashley Madison data. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think this is happening more and more. and. Um, uh, we're going to get a lot more of these problems. I think uh, Evgeny Morozov, you might know him, he's, he's a media philosopher or technology philosopher. He writes about, he's waiting for the, tech, for the privacy apocalypse, as he calls it. Right? He says we won't start caring about this until we're all affected in a big way. And right now we're in a vacuum where we are given a lot of data, but we haven't really, you know, the, 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 the problems haven't really reached us yet. They will, but it's going to take a while. And I think actually medicine for me was like an, a before shock to this thing. Like it was the first time when really, a lot of people, like it led to suicides and a lot of bro broken relationships. I think that was a good example of what we're going to get later on in a, in a maybe a grander sense. Like in Israel, the government has, has leaks of all their citizen information. And not just once, it happens every two years for the past years. So they basically, they have, if we had done this project in Israel, we wouldn't even have to have done it because it was available uh, if you look well enough. So these, these leaks, these incredible leaks are, are happening more and more, and uh, we restricted ourselves to not using leaks. Boy, was that difficult because it was so attractive. There are so many interesting leaks now. So um, I live here in Austin, and I called to uh, AT and T to sign up for their high-speed internet, like the gigafiber thing. If you want to put here, and um, I was told it would be $110 a month unless I opted in for AT and T to monitor all of my browsing activity and then they would drop it $35 a month. Um, so I was outraged and I was like, no, and I'm not even gonna sign up for this in the first place. Um, so I've told that story to people I work with and family members. I find it to be an incredible um, abuse of privacy, but a lot of the responses I've got are like, well, I'm not really doing anything bad, so what do I care if anyone's watching? Um, I guess what would be, so my question is, what would be, what do you think is a good answer to that, that, that really hits home, that's not an hour talk, because I mean, I, I got it before, I definitely get it now, but like, what do you say to someone that, you're just like, well, I don't do anything wrong, so uh, it's, it's fine, I don't mind, it's a good yeah. deal. It's also because um, I, I think that um, uh, I have noth nothing to hide um, is uh, quite, the um, well, it's 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 not really a, a a good thing to say because a lot of people uh, have uh, something to hide for um, a number of reasons, not because they're criminals, because but maybe because they're weird or stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I have weird hobbies too, and I don't want you guys all to know about it, but. Um, <coughs> Uh, it's also that um, if uh, a lot of people uh, give up their data, um, uh, there's a lot of social pressure. So um, the answer you get, like I have nothing to hide, uh, is, well, it's, they, they, they are thinking all about, uh, only about themselves really, because they are, they are putting social pressure on others as well. And I think that there isn't really a good, quick answer yet. I mean, there used to be a joke that if you've got nothing to hide, then pull down your pants, right? But that's yeah. <laughs> sure, <okay. laughs> But I don't think that's a good answer. I think, like, I think that the things that we're talking about, I think what I see happening, but now I'm getting maybe a little bit abstract, but we used to have this old system where you, uh, if you had did a crime, then there was a, a threat of force by the government, they had a, a, a monopoly on force, and then you could end up in prison, right? There's a classic, we understand that, if you do a crime, blah, blah. I think we see a second system evolving now, which is, is not about the threat of force, but it's the threat of social pressure. Not really a threat, I guess, but we are now being able to design social pressure better and better. That's what's happening right now. We are designing behavior. And, um, and that, of course, means that big data is the source of that, like to know what's going on, and then we have all these behavior design and, and uh, systems to, to, to influence people subtly. And this system is much less visible, and people don't you know, respond as visually to it, as roughly to it when it's used. Because it's so invisible and so subtle, 
So I think that's why a lot of governments are so, are so interested in it, because it's just so subtle. But it's still very powerful. I think it might even be more, more powerful. So this is a scary, scary time, I think. Hey, so I wanted to piggyback off that. I've heard, um, and I've actually read a lot lately, that privacy is a really young and new concept, regardless, and maybe privacy never existed to begin with. So I was wondering, kind of to that question, what would your response be to, to, to that idea or that concept that you know, maybe it was never there at all? And I don't have direct quotes, but I know it's... I'd say like, feminism is pretty young, and, and women's right to vote is pretty young, but I don't think we, we'd be better off without it. Right, like it's, it's, it's called civilization grows in its capacity, and, and what we what we gather and what we've reached, I think, is something that we've come to a place where we have privacy is fucking brilliant. Sorry for the bad language, but that's really good. I think I think I think it really helped us. I think it's been a, an important factor in, in how we've gotten so far as a society as well, um, and a fundamental part of, of democracy, for example, a fundamental building block for that. So I would not. Um, Sure, we might not have always had it, but we haven't always had democracy either. You know, it's 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 something that we've gotten, and we should not throw away so easily. It's access too. You know, if a bad now a bad guy in California, Montana, you know, name any state can get your stuff, as opposed to the guy down the street. <coughs> also, yeah. next question. Hey, um, I have an answer to help you argue about why you may not have something to hide. Um, so one way you can think of it is. Maybe you don't have something to hide today because you're just browsing around the internet. But maybe something you're looking at today is illegal in the future, and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And once you, do, once you do something on the internet, it's there forever. And potentially, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 30 years from now, something you're looking at now is illegal, and it can come back to haunt you if that data has been captured. So that's one way to think of it. An example we use it. So if you want to join in on the group photo. Yeah. <laughs>